for every season of the year, there is a cider. And in this here episode of Cider Chat, you're going to hear about one particular Dutch cidery that is embracing the seasonality of ciders and its regional terroir. Hey, 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 my name is Rhea Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. In last week's episode 305, we heard from Arjun Middelson of Elegas Cidery in the Netherlands. This week, we're having an extended conversation with him about his cidery and talking about the seasonality of ciders and how Elegas is delivering this to the consumers, which I just think is absolutely brilliant because it really provides an educational component that is often missing for cider fans. You know, we kind of get boxed in thinking cider is only a fall drink. Cider is only a fall drink. Well, it might be made in the in the fall. I mean, apples, you know, finally happen to be ripe and ready to be picked in the fall. But that doesn't mean that cider, when made with intention, can't really round out the year and be perfect for the winter months, the spring, the summer and the fall. So we'll be coming up to his conversation shortly, but first we're going to have a wee bit of news from out and about in Ciderville. This is for all the commercial cider makers out there. The New York International Cider Competition is in its fourth annual year, and it's taking place this February 2022. So this is your last and final reminder to get in your entries now. And it's unique from all other cider competitions in that the judges are trade buyers. Producers and makers are not judges at this competition, which makes absolute sense to me because as a commercial maker, you want to know if your cider that you produced is going to be able to get onto the shelves. Unless you are just solely selling your cider from your tasting room, then then it might be a little bit different. But by and large, most people do want to ship it somewhere or get it on the shelves. And this is going to give you a good idea. Are you hitting the price point? And are you hitting the flavor profile for consumers? I'd like to take this one step further and just look at cider judging in the U.S. as of 2022. We're going to exclude all the other countries, many of which have a lot more longevity than we do in the U.S. because we only really started in 84, 1984 with enough cideries that I could count on my hand. And then somewhere around 2007, you start having some folks come in, and then it really took off around you know 2012, up to 2014, up to 2016. We saw a lot of growth in cider. So that means that you have producers in a very short span of time, let me say 10 years, maybe 15 years if you're lucky, judging ciders. And most of those makers up until only recently, have been able to get product from all over the country. They might have just gotten that product, but they might never have even actually traveled to that location, which, you got to be honest here, gives you a whole different profile taste than just getting a bottle shipped to your doorstep. So without that in your pocket, you have a particular type of judging at other competitions when you're solely relying on judges who are makers and producers or enthusiasts because the enthusiasts are doing the best they can, you know, with cider shares and they're doing a damn good job of that. But a lot of times it's being shipped. It really changes the ball game when you get to travel there. And that's the longevity that we still lack in this country. And it won't happen until we have something that's really addressing that. And people are going to the site and visiting on site, smelling the land seeing the sky, tasting the food, and getting involved in the culture. That changes everything for a judge. And to me, that puts you in a whole different category. So, <laughs> look, I'm not putting down other competitions by any means because, you know, you got to practice, 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 and it never ends. But we also have an opportunity here for commercial makers 
to really get in front of a category of judges who are a whole other avenue than any other competition in this country. Do know that this is an international cider competition, so that would make it very beneficial for international producers to send your ciders here because you're going to be getting feedback, again, based on the market. And we know the U.S. is a growing cider market, so it's going to be really uh, in your favor to get that info now rather than later. The time is now to enter for this year's fourth annual New York International Cider Competition. And you could do that by going to nyiciderCompetition.com. And on this note about cider competitions, I think it's really cool that the American Cider Association is now allowing competitions to hand out awards during the lunch hour. They had the Glint Cap Awards handed out during lunch. I was not there because I was kind of sequestering away and having my lunch, you know, doing uh, protocols for safety for myself. But I did find out that one of our patrons of Cider Chat, and that's Dave at Alma, he won the Grand Champion Award for Glint Cap and was walking around with this towering uh, uh, trophy I guess that Mike Beck of Uncle John Cider made. It was super cool. It had a little cask on top and you get your names on it. But he was able to walk around with it, but he couldn't keep it. So I got a, a, a great photo of him. And if you want to see that, you go to the Cider Chat TikTok account at Cider Chat or go to Instagram and see the reel that I put up about the last day being at Cider, CiderCon as I was leaving Richmond. I got a great photo of Dave there from Alma Cider and kudos to him. Really wonderful, (laughs) really exciting to tell you the truth. So maybe this is a new trend that the American Cider Association is going to be doing, allowing cider competitions to hand out their medals during lunch hour. You know, trends start somewhere and in fairness to all other cider competitions, it seems like that would be the right thing to do. So stay tuned. Maybe next year we'll see Adam Levy at CiderCon in Chicago handing out medals for the New York International Cider Competition. That'd be really exciting. And maybe there would be more other U.S. competitions up there on the stage, too, passing out those medals and making everyone smile. Walking through the orchards. Last week's trip to Richmond, Virginia was phenomenal. If you want to check out some of the reels I made about it, little video snippets, you could check those out at Cider Chat Ciderville on Instagram and at Cider Chat on TikTok. Myself and the Talking Palms had one heck of a trip going down. We did have a little snafu with the van, our little cider van, but we made it safe and sound, and uh, the return trip was really a breeze. I did it all in one day, the driving, and kind of... I'm still recovering from that, but I'm doing okay. You know, if that's the biggest complaint I have, I'm doing pretty damn lucky. Uh, One of the highlights for being at CiderCon was taking the tour of Jackson Ward. Now, Richmond, Virginia, we have found out, you know, was really the epicenter of the culture of how blacks were treated in America. And I don't want to say a lot about that. I want to recommend that you go down to Richmond, Virginia and take this tour. It will blow your mind, and stimulate so much conversation. Short of that, if you can't do that, then I recommend going to the Facebook page for Gary Flowers. I'm going to have a link in the show notes for that, but you could you could find it on Facebook. Every single day this week of February, which is Black History Month, he is putting out a fact about Black history in America. And it also happens that Gary Flowers was our tour guide. And he delivered like nobody's business. It was Academy Award material and presentation. Uh, I couldn't stop talking about going into this speakeasy in Jackson Ward. And the, the front of the room was amazing. Then you'd go back to this little hallway and you would open up this giant hutch and walk into this floor to, I don't know, 30, 40 foot ceiling high room in the back. Mirror windows on one side, a balcony, and a giant, beautiful chandelier. You could feel the vibe in there. You could like feel the people dancing around. I kept on showing the video of this little clip I took to everyone I met because I was just humming with the energy there. 
And then from the speakeasy, we went up to the top balcony and were able to walk into the Hippodrome, which has been in Jackson Ward for a long time. It was a theater, and now they they changed the theater level, the upper level where they showed all the movies and, you know, the big reels back there and the big projectors is now a bar, and they have events back there. It is... Uh, it was mind-boggling. But that was just one part of the tour. And then to learn about this woman by the name of Maggie Lena Walker and what she did for that area and the community, it was just amazing. Um, so a lot to be said about there. I'm going to refer you to Gary Flowers' show on Facebook. Check it out every day this month and follow him. He He's just one of those you know heroes, just a, 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 a mind of... Of material and passion, and I, I will, uh, you know, I will. It'll be many days before I forget that. So that was really my highlight. Besides seeing everybody, I really appreciate folks coming up to me and telling me how much Cider Chat has kept them company over this past year during the pandemic, and it's kind of a, a connectivity when you're kind of lost out there in the storm. That meant a lot to me. If you could actually. Put that in writing and send that to me. That would be awesome. Maybe I'll be able to use that. <laughs> Take a little time today. Put that in a little note. Send it my way as I try to uh, you know, rile up a little bit of attention for a cider chat. So again, thanks, thank you all for coming up to me. And I apologize if there's anyone that I met. It kind of took me a minute to kind of register you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at that. And sometimes I'm, I draw a blank. But the love is there and the appreciation. So... Um, well, it's just, it was just lovely seeing you. All right. With that, uh, I'm going to take a little break here and then we're going to be rolling to our featured conversation with Arjun Mielsen of Elegast Cidery in the Netherlands. The Netherlands will always hold a very special place in my heart. In fact, I call it often my second home. I had the opportunity to work there for over 10 years and get to know the culture very intimately. And like in my own home country of America, I was able to see changes both in the political structure and in the taste buds of the Dutch. In fact, when I first started working there, there was no such thing on the shelves such as India Pale Ale. You know, that average IPA that Americans adore? That is only really a recent phenomenon in the Netherlands, and now you see it everywhere. And so was cider. When I first started working in the Netherlands in 2008, I did not see cider anywhere. And now today, there is a growing craft culture for cider makers, and in turn, a growing palate for cider. So join with me as we grab a glass and join this chat with Arjun Mielsen of Elega Cidery in the Netherlands. I am trained as a landscape architect and um, worked in a firm for quite a while. And then uh, my wife, Pauline, and I, we decided we wanted to live abroad for a while. And by chance, we ended up in Portland, Oregon. We didn't know much about it, so started looking it up. And we actually had the most brilliant time and couldn't imagine having lived in a better city for that time in our lives. Um, for the outdoors, the people, the culture, uh, yeah, we loved everything about it, actually. Um, and then at some point, I cycled, uh, like I do here, uh, to work. Um, and uh, I passed the sign of Reverend Ned's Hard Cider uh, tasting room several times. And then at some point, said, well, that, that's curious. Uh, let's have a look. And we had a tasting flight of ciders, and I was amazed by the diversity of, uh, yeah, of, of varieties of cider that you could get there. And I, I never had anything like it in the Netherlands, so I, I thought, um, this is interesting. We need to have something like this back home. And well, importing cider didn't seem like anything I would be interested in. Um, but then a bit later on, I was actually on a, a hike on Mount Hood, still there. Um, I thought about the old orchards that we have in the Netherlands and I thought if you could make a cider out of the apples that are not often harvested actually so they're commercially not viable anymore these old orchards Um, and I was always interested as a landscape architect in uh, sort of business strategies to uh, have a sustainable landscape so for example my thesis was about cradle to cradle in regional development Um, and so I thought if you could make an 
a value-added product, then uh, maybe this brings in enough money to sustain these orchards in the long run. Um, so I got on the phone, uh, called Teun, uh, with whom I do the business now. And, um, well, we set making cider when I got back in 2016. And uh, we liked the first result. I mean, it's not nearly as good as we <laughs> decided we make, we make now, but we liked it. And we sold it in four months. We made 400 liter that first year. and um, that yeah. Th then we from there we uh, we started taking it seriously and um, grow it. Um, and yeah, then I was still a landscape architect, so cider chat was very important to me in that beginning period because I felt sometimes a bit lonely. You know, when you start a venture that people in my country didn't understand or know anything about you. Like I had all these dreams of what it could be, but um, it's hard to communicate it and uh, hard to find examples. To um, so listening to Cider Chat uh, was sort of my connection to the bigger world of cider makers, and I learned a lot from it, and also felt supported at times when I was. Uh, yeah, it, it's not easy. It's not always easy to start up a business beside your main job, you know. So um, yeah, so it was uh, hugely influential for me. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool to yeah. hear. I often felt like when I was when we we connected early on, I would be imagining you riding on your bike. I did many times, yeah. And listening to the podcast, you know, it just I love yeah. that image because it's one of the things I just love about the Netherlands. It's, it's just such a healthy place. That the the people have impeccable posture. And <laughs> and to be able to ride a bike everywhere, it's just, it's beautiful. So, um, yeah, we, we've been connected for a while in so many ways. I love that. You started like in, like in Portland, you got kind of turned on to cider. And I know, you know, I was working in the Netherlands like 20, 2008 to 2018, um, going there pretty frequently. And the, the culture of cider in the country was just starting. You know, there was a cider cider down in Rotterdam, yep. um, a cider winkel, you know, up in uh, Amsterdam. And, you know, little pockets of, of uh, Het Cider House um, yep. in uh, Ultrek. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's a number of people. And of course, now there's Marcel down a little bit, uh, quite a bit on the southern border. And so it's been growing for a while, which really makes me uh, super ecstatic. So we're going to talk a little bit about the culture, but let, let's talk for folks who aren't familiar with the Netherlands, where it's located and where your cidery is, because you, you started your cidery. Did you have the actual site then that you are now producing on when you were making the cider and then selling it? No, not yet. We started in Utrecht, so maybe indeed about the uh, Netherlands in general, um, because it's indeed re very relevant for orchards. So um, it's in the yeah, sort of northwest mainland Europe, um, where the River Rhine that starts in the Alps, that flows between Germany and France, and then ends in the North Sea in the Netherlands. And so it's a country that's mainly created by the sedimentation of these big rivers because it's not only the Rhine but there's a few more um, and this makes for so it's a very flat country it's it's a delta uh, a river delta um, so um, where the old orchards are is always along rivers large or small where you had these rivers would flow and then we we talk about the millennia um, that uh, they would overflow and then first spill the light um, dirt uh, the clay along the rivers and then the heavy clay so the finer particles further away and so we call that an overval uh, so it's like uh, the like the higher uh, bedding uh, around the river it's really a bit higher than the uh, flat low uh, soil that's further away from the river that's actually lower country mm -hmm. um, and very dense clay um, so the orchards are always on this light clay along the rivers and uh, I made a map of it, actually, of all where the orchards are that we harvest from. And you see that they're always along these uh, rivers. So that's uh, why we have a lot of apples and pears. So the Netherlands is a very um, uh, pro uh, productive agricultural country and also fruit-growing uh, country. Um, but funnily enough, uh, we have no cider history at all. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Really? Like none strange. at all? Yeah. No, no, no. It's it's so weird. Uh, I'm I'm 
I'm reading and also uh, this new book that's standing behind you, Ambachtelijke Cider, uh, so craft cider in the Netherlands. It will say a little bit about that on farms people used to make it for their own consumption, um, but there's hardly any record recordings and, uh, and um, no commercial uh, production at all. Um, and, well, yeah, it's strange, you know, I mean, you, you make apple juice, you ferment it and you have cider, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's interesting at the least, yeah. A lot of the old orchards that you're speaking of, because I've seen some old orchards down in Zeeland, which is on mm -hmm. the southern uh, southeast portion, beautiful area. Are they all used then for eating or were used and cultivated for eating? Uh, yeah, and sauce and juice well, and cooking and drying. Right. And so apple strof. Exactly. Which is yeah. just... It, we don't really have anything like that in the U.S. We have something mm. called cider syrup, yeah. where they boil it down. But what are, what is being done when you make apple strof? And it comes in like a little tin can yeah. uh, container, like a jar. It's really cool the way it's packaged. And there's a couple yeah. different, you know, mass-produced ones. But is that boiled? And then and then what? It is. What takes place with that? Yeah, so they boil it in uh, like in the past in copper large copper pots and now uh, uh, in in stainless steel uh, tanks. But um, it, there's a whole science to it because it, the apples and pears shouldn't be too sour, uh, too acidic or sour because then um, and so they they shouldn't break loose too easily. They shouldn't attach to the sides of the container because then they, they burn. So there's quite they're quite specific in fruit varieties. So last year actually we got some fruit of people that wanted to make syrup out of it, but they um, they, they couldn't do this out of these varieties because they had too much acid in them. Um, so then we took them for the cider. But um, yeah, so it, it, it's really a, a craft. Every time I go to the Netherlands, I would have to bring back some of that to one specific. Uh, orchardist, and that was Carol B. Hillman, who I've mentioned on the podcast quite often at New Salem uh, Preserves. She just, she originally told me about that product, and then I started yep. working in the Netherlands. It was like, oh, I have to bring this back, and it, you know, it lasts a long time. It's really a beautiful product. Yeah, they, they made it more dense in uh, by by boiling it in, set like seven times. Uh, it's as as dense, uh, so the sugar content and the flavor content. Um, well, there's a commercial version where they use actually sugar beet uh, to make it sweeter, or glucose syrup to make it sweeter. Mm -hmm. um, but the, like the original version that you can buy in uh, in uh, like organic stores, um, that's like pure uh, apple and pear mostly. Let's talk a little bit about the location of your cidery. It started in Ultrick, which is in just, in the middle. Yeah, middle. So it's south of uh, yeah. Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, which is a pretty <clears throat> short train ride, right? Yeah, just half an hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now we are just no, uh, in between Utrecht and Amsterdam, actually, in Hilversum. Tell us a little bit about, like, arriving to your scene. Like, what, what would we see? Yeah, so actually it's an old estate. So um, when you drive to us, uh, either by car or by bike, <laughs> it's uh, you cross the heath and the forest uh, on a... Uh, kilometer, so almost a mile uh, long road, um, and then you enter um, an estate of 13 hectares. It used to be a hunting lodge in the 17th century, and then it turned into a manor house, where later they built also a sheep farm and a farmer's cottage with a large walled garden for vegetables. Uh, they had a guest house, which was also a manor on itself, and they even built a library for uh, the owners that... Uh, were very interested in books and um, then later on it turned into a conference center and then at some point um, they were looking for new entrepreneurs and I was looking for another uh, for a place actually to make the production because we were in an old greenhouse in Utrecht and we didn't have any insulation uh, running water uh, yeah there was no facility whatsoever so um, yeah, I, I just love this old building. It's uh, it's 150 years old uh, where we are in, and it's tiny. I mean, it's 250 uh, square feet, uh, so 25 square meter, 250 square feet more or less. We had first the press in there, and then uh, made it into the tasting room, and then put the press in another uh, a room of an old shed, which is 150 square feet, so 15 square meters. So it's all tiny. 
and we just we make it happen in this space and we ferment outside so we have all the tanks ibc sartotes mm -hmm. we have them standing outside and uh, we start pressing when it's cold so late october then the temperature drops uh below 15 degrees which is in fahrenheit when it's below 59 degrees fahrenheit that's when we start pressing and then we have a wild fermentation uh the whole winter uh out outside with the ambient temperature and that's why we don't need a lot of uh, real estate uh we can just uh mm. when it's done we have the press is in the storage near in the farmer and we use the same uh room to bottle it and then from there we bring it to our storage so we have a storage space in Hilversum uh, of uh, 50 square meters so 500 square feet let's back up to that statement that you're how you're using this space because i think that'll be really interesting for makers who are designing their own setup or you know even folks like myself i've put cider outside and it's frozen and yeah. you know I, i've lived with it but it's not my preference uh so you have these in the barrels and it's at 59 degrees, but like we were just talking earlier, you know, about ice skating and how the yeah, yeah, ice yeah. temperature yeah. comes down. So how do you manage that piece? Because we know that in the Netherlands, you have a lot of rain, uh, which is fine for the barrels, right? Uh, but you don't yeah. really want that absorption coming in uh, into the barrel. So what have you found there? Yeah, so mostly we use uh, totes or IBC tanks. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, so they stand outside and the... Uh, they have a pressure valve, uh, so to release the CO2. I see. And uh, they they just stand outside, and that works really well. And then even when we had a big frost uh, uh, last year, then um, we had a little bit of ice on top in the cider, um, and then yeah, you know the the yeast they freeze, they they go just go dormant, and then when it heats up again, they do their work again and we have wonderful cider so uh yeah no harm done actually mm. and the barrels uh we've noticed in the summer that we got a few leaks uh but it was around the time that we wanted to bottle them anyways mm -hmm. um so i think the big frost and then warming up again was not so good so in the future we'll put them inside so that's why we're going to open a second location which we just visited this morning whoa Oh, whoa. oh, that's exciting! In the same yeah, yeah. in the same area? No, no, near our old university, Wageningen University. That's fantastic. Yeah. Developments going on here. Yeah, it's a very special day. We visited it today for the first time. Wow! So <laughs> cider is definitely going up in the Netherlands. That's yeah, cool. that, that means that the demand is there, and also that you're making a really fine product too. That all goes hand in hand. Super cool! Wow. So how, how big is that production facility going to be? And is it production or a tasting room too? Both, 250 square meters. So that's, uh, uh, well, around uh, 2,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, it's 10 times as large as our uh, tasting room here. Uh, so there we will be able to uh, have everything in one place. So uh, hmm. pressing, bottling, uh, labeling, uh, warehouse mm -hmm. tasting room what's your timeline well we should uh, lease it in march and then open the tasting room okay. yeah may or june so we want to have it open in summer you already have the product so you don't have to wait to be making that you just have to set up the actual space to be able to exactly deliver. wow do you get a lot of questions like we would have initially in the u.s and not that we still don't have that right confusion over what is cider mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you see in the Netherlands in, in that way for the, the patrons? A big change as opposed to when we started. Um, so when we started in 2016, many people would indeed ask, what is cider? Or um, And now I notice that people have an opinion on it or are somewhat educated already. And often it's from holidays. And I yeah, then I'm, I'm a bit confused, like, why wasn't that the same as five years ago? Because people used to go on holidays as well then. But maybe because internationally cider has been growing, that people on a holiday uh, have more, uh, are more exposed to cider. Um, yeah, I, I wonder, like, I have the feeling that there's more um, awareness about what cider is. And so it's mostly that people name it from holidays in France or England or Spain that they have tasted it and you of course have like the 
Heineken, who owns uh, different cider brands, but they have made big promotions in the past years in cider. And at least people know that there is something like a beverage that's made from apples. And then they also, um, yeah, they understand how it works. You know, you have a commercial industrial suite thing, and that goes in many categories of drinks. And then there is a craft uh, libation that you could also uh, and it's probably more refined and less sweet so that's I think it goes in more categories so people can easily imagine that if they've seen cider in a supermarket then they see that we make a cider and it will probably be different and they are interested in okay so this is probably the real thing what's this then and yeah so I think there's some curiosity in that sense so I think those those two trends helped. It's really a farm to table product. Like I, I think about the history in, in my short history of being in the Netherlands and the craft beer scene. IPA was only like a recent uh, mm-hmm. fusion into the culture there, and I would think it it kind of <clears throat> I started seeing it around 2016 or so, but it. And now yeah. it's much more pre- prevalent, right? You see a Indian yeah. pale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. And it was like a, 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 not that there weren't large beer makers in the country like Heineken and and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Jupler. Is that it? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's Belgium, I think. But oh, is that uh, Belgium. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, that's all right. No, but I, I know that there's a couple, and actually down in Zeeland, there's a um, beer. But it wasn't something that I really gravitated towards the beer. Now you have this like much more active beer community and all seemed that the craft beer and cider started blowing up at the same time. Would you say that's true or? For sure. I think it's similar to, um, because I've listened to your podcast a lot and um, um, I think it's similar to what happened in uh, the U S where you had first this craft beer wave Mm -hmm. and then later, uh, if I'm correct, you have the cider uh, wave in uh, uh in its wake and i think the same is happening here uh so that um and that's also sort of um giving me constant confidence because we've had this craft beer wave so why wouldn't we have a craft cider wave Mm -hmm. Uh, so i I think the circumstances are are very similar um and that so people are it's opening up their palates they're interested in you know they can they can uh they're more interested in and uh and looking for new things uh that's uh also with untapped is an example of it so people are almost hunting for each each weekend they want quite a few new varieties and then when there's a cider that's also barrel aged or wild fermented or there's cherries in it or whatever then that's something they also want to try because they're in sort of this um this this mood or or lifestyle of wanting to try new things and i think that happened that wasn't the case before craft beer when i was like like 10 or 15 years ago you would just go to a bar and order the same belgian beers that everyone drank for the past 30 years and then um yeah since since 10 years this craft beer like exploded and then since five year cider is slowly growing and i hope maybe at some day also becoming larger. Um, it's growing. So I'm, I'm noticing yeah, it's following a trend that I sort of expected. No doubt. I hope to steer it as well a bit, you know, that's also what motivates me to make cider in a way that we do, because um, it could explode in a way that's very like commercial, but it could also explode in a way that's actually helpful uh, in what, what motivates me a lot, helpful for the planet. So we, try to uh, explain to people that um, organic orchards or old trees make better cider than um, commercial sprayed orchards. Um, And we've actually noticed it. I mean, it's not something that we make up. Um, And um, in that sense, by making cider, you're supporting these old orchards. And now we're uh, even going to um, start a new product line that will actually uh, develop new food forests and orchards by like re- literally spending revenues on uh, planting forest food forests. So is that like a proceeds a, a, a bottle or a style that yeah, you're making exactly. go towards that? Oh, nice. Very yeah, good. exactly. Yeah. So in that sense, I hope that you know the cider is a new category and we can actually use it for the good uh, rather than making it just another um, beverage category. You know, it could, it can have a meaning. And I noticed that many 
of our fellow cider makers in the country use the same methodology um, and have the same aims. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite hopeful that um, it's sort of th this wave is happening and we can steer it a bit. Yeah. And that's in that's interesting. Sometimes smallness is kind of like the key to making it grow in that there is just a, uh, you know, I mean, there's like probably there's over like 10 cider makers in the country. Now, yeah. Right. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. And you have uh, um, Apples and Peren in uh, Amsterdam, a great destination for folks arriving into the city. You could go right up to a cider store and get your cider and many other local products. Um, I, I recall back, is I was looking at the date, it was 2016 where I set up a cider meetup at the, uh, the yeah. uh, which was wild. It was just, it was amazing to be in the country at that time with just a small group of makers, the folks who could get their importers. Margo was there from Het Cider House and Martin, who's an import, Porter too. And, um, you yeah, know, it just blew me out of the water to just be there on the cusp. And now that's just a short window of time. We're talking like six years later and here you are yeah. opening up your second production room. Yeah. You know, it's, it's cool because in the U S we're so big and so broad, but here we get to kind of watch a country, which is, you know, pretty densely populated country in many ways and see how an entire culture is being shifted over is absolutely fascinating. And I really recommend anyone out there in Ciderville to be following the Netherlands. Definitely go to the Netherlands and drink the cider and <laughs> get there now because it's going to be changing over time. So let, let, let's talk about apples. The main, like the hypothesis was, can we support local orchards by making these value-added products? So importing anything is not, uh, not what we do. And um, what I found inspirational in Portland where um, that they made a cider from these uh, the consu consumption apples, eating apples. Um, and I didn't know you could actually do that. I thought you could only make cider from French and uh, English varieties. And I mean, I, I hardly knew anything about cider. Eh? Um, and so that opened my eyes. And um, we started with using uh, saison yeast, the beer yeast, to make the cider, um, following the example of uh, Reverend Nat. And um, that actually produced a sort of a bitter bitterness and earthiness and some farmyard that I found like giving it a bit of layered and complexity uh, that I liked a lot. And um, so we still make that. And then uh, later, like in the second year, I think we started with wild fermentation and we read a lot of warnings that it's very dangerous and you shouldn't do it. Uh, and But actually it turned very uh, turned out very uh, uh, stable, re a re very reliable way to get a fruity cider that's still complex. And um, so now 95% of what we make is wild fermented. And um, yeah, we noticed that actually in our opinion, Dutch cider or like eating apples are very um you can make a good cider out of it but you need to uh, yeah take notion of a few characteristics eh? so the acidity shouldn't be too high and you should work on it so over the years we found a few ways uh, that we can discuss of course of how to manage acidity and not make it too acidic in the end the cider mm -hmm. and also um it's lacking um tannins um so how to still get some mouthfeel and depth mm -hmm. and um there's also ways to work with it and especially the way apples are grown interests me in that sense eh? so if you have a commercial orchard that's producing for the masses um that will have less tannins um and also less yeast and bacteria than uh, an old tree that's not sprayed um so there's quite a few reasons i think why old orchards provide better fruit with more tannins. Uh, so actually we now made one. These are the old, oldest trees um, that we uh, that we have around. Um, so they are planted in 1939, just before the Second World War. Um, uh, they're Bel de Bosco a lot and a little bit of ananas, trinet. Um, and yeah, this cider, it's like, it's amazing. It's so full of, tenants like it you're you're surprised that it's even these varieties but it's it's only because these orchards are so so old and and 
how large would this orchard be? How many hectares of of uh, two hectares? I think two hectares. And are they yeah. are they planted in a certain way? Are, are they standard uh, trees? Obviously, nineteen thirty nine. I'm assuming standard. Uh, it is a it is an UNESCO heritage uh, site. In that's an old defense line that's actually built in the nineteenth century already. And this is a camouflage orchard. So they plant it on top of the fortifications they planted these trees and so imagine walking between um bits, uh, trenches um so you have the mounds beside you that go up three meters mm -hmm. and then on top of it are trees that are now I, i'm i maybe 20 meters high because i have a ladder that you can uh fold out in like three pieces so it's the highest ladder that you can have and that reached that can reach the top of a house almost and then i just touch the the crown of the tree and because it goes up from there so it's hardly impossible to to uh, get the apples there but that that's where we got the best yeah like amazing cider from so <laughs> oh my goodness and yeah would you say that there's lots of these little hidden orchards no there? no 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 that's this is unique. quite it's okay. unique yeah yeah <laughs> no, because actually in the 70s they, there was um there was funding to cut orchards like this and so we had a big modernization in our agriculture policy in the 60s and 70s the european union and then also each country uh, they would actually pay farmers to cut these standard orchards because uh, low orchards were more productive um, and so people would cut them down plant these uh, low row orchards very intense so three meters apart and mm -hmm. So you start spraying pesticides, fertilizer, the whole system of where you can manipulate your natural surrounding to get the, the most uh, uh, fruit as possible. But mm -hmm. what we notice now is that that's not necessarily bringing out the best cider, uh, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. And so, yeah, Kiss the Ground the documentary, that's for me, it's very motivating to... Uh, yeah, to, to work on transitioning and changing this uh, agricultural paradigm. But let's talk about your cider and, and the styles that you're making. You mentioned that you're doing wild ferment, but let's get a little bit further into that. I know you work, work with barrels. Uh, is there a flagship cider right now for, for El Hast? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's... That? Absolutely. And that's a good question because we've been discussing it. Um, uh, I would say the wild cider and our farmhouse saison cider. So it's two. <laughs> mm. Let's talk about the wild cider then. Uh, it's 6.9% alcohol by volume. And on the bottle, it's all in Dutch here. Would we yeah. be able to get this uh, at other locations other than Apple and, and Perrin and Amsterdam uh, and going to your tasting room. Where else, if I was arriving in the Netherlands, would I be able to get this cider? Well, we sell now uh, in many uh, beer stores, wine stores, and delicatessen stores. So that's stores that sell, for example, cheese and other uh, like good foods. Um, and um, yeah, so m m mainly those. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Wow. So they have a shelf for cider now that you'll see if you go into a like a craft beer store. Yeah, yeah. And I can't read what's on the bottle. I could see Save Orchards Drink Cider on the bottom there. Um, yes, you can. But the rest of it is in Dutch. How well do you know what's on your label here? Can you tell me a little bit about what it says? Oh, there he goes. He had a bottle right there. This is a 750 mil bottle. It's a you know crown cap bottle, and you have the little um, jackal up on the top of the the crown cap too. What what do we have here? What 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 are you saying on the bottle? I'm kind of curious about the label. What you're putting on there? Yeah. So it says. Um accessible and yet layered cider with a floral aroma hints of honeydew melon and a dry and fruity finish um, part of this wild cider is comprised of the apples api noir and cur uh, fermented on neut neutral tanks another part of the cider is fermented on oak barrels uh, red wine and whiskey um, and actually, I don't didn't note it here, but the, those are Bramley and Bel de Bosco apples that were fermented on the okay. barrels. All right. Yeah. And then we say Elegast gives with these this 
craft cider a new and sustainable um, future for uh, unsprayed orchards and uh, by doing this supports our landscape and our biodiversity save orchards drink cider Mm, right on Cool. So you uh, start in a neutral tank and then you go into the barrels. The barrels you... No, it's uh, a blend, a blend actually. So uh, the oh. Bremley and the Belle de Bosco were barrel fermented because they're quite high in the acids. So that's why we put them in barrels and that actually softens the acids. Mm-hmm. And then um, the other were in the, in the totes uh, fermented. So I'm ho- holding right now the Bonfire, which is a bourbon barrel aged cider. And it says with Kraft Apple... Pear, um, pears syrup, and this is uh, ABV of eight point five percent alcohol by volume. So let's talk about Bonfire. I love the name of it. It's uh, in a smaller uh, bottle. I would almost. It's not a twenty-two ounce bottle. Uh, it's probably five hundred. Yeah. Uh, and it is a brown label. Uh, kind of sets it apart from the seven fifty mil. Tell me about this one. This sounds amazing too. Hmm. Yeah, so this is uh, the part. Or this is part of this series of barrel aged, and we always do it in a 500 ml bottle because uh, that uh, makes it easy to distinguish. And we give the uh, we give the uh, labels a color uh, so that you actually can have a neat row of different colored uh, labels. And people mm-hmm. like to collect them, huh? so they want uh, the red and the blue and the yellow label and like they're all very warm colors so it's not a it's not a yellow yellow or a, it's very warm colors because we um we um offer them for sale in december uh so it's really our winter uh version um and uh, that goes really well so we often sell them out in two or three months uh every barrel age that we make and um it's perfect for the holidays you know as a gift or to bring over to people so um that's uh, yeah, that, that's very successful. And um, the bonfire is actually a cider that's aged in bourbon barrels that also had a stout beer in them. Um, mm. And uh, then we put um, this apple syrup, uh, what we talked about in the past. So this is mm. apples, uh, apple strop that's actually boiled in a copper kettle. Um, and we put uh, 11 kilos in one barrel. Um, so that made it 8.4%. And then, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very good winter cider. Oh uh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. That's, I could just see the dark, you know, syrup, yeah. the, yeah. the yeah. apple stroke being poured in there. And yeah, there's oh, a photo wow. of it on our Instagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Wow. And what a cool idea to have it as like a series too. So you, yeah. you're, you are positioning yourself up as uh, a cidery that does meet the seasons and brings people along into that versus having a, a whole bunch of ciders. And it's like, you know, yeah, what, you know, you decide. I think that's nice that you're doing that for patrons because they know then how to approach each season a little bit differently and know that it does count what <clears throat> happens for the apples, later apples versus early apples, eating apples versus, you know, really defined cider, high tannin uh, um, apples. Really cool. Wow. All right. So that's a bonfire. I want to talk about all three ciders that I have in front of me here. And this one has little cherries on it. I can't, yeah. I can't say. I'm going to see if I could get it here. All right. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. Nice. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Prost. Um, a kick cider. So are we going to expect a little bit of like a sour profile to this in that like more yeah. defined kind of beer way? Well, t- tell me about this because this isn't something that folks have done too much, but I know people have been using different yeast, playing with different yeast for this type of style of cider. Should okay. we open one? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> oh, I'm, ready. I'm gonna just move it away a little bit from my computer here. Yeah. Gonna, let me see. I, I, I'm glad it came in yesterday so I could let it settle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, geez, there it goes. Just a little bit. I mean, come on, it came all the way across the ocean. 
It's the excitement of cider. Oh, look at the color in your glass. Just a beautiful <laughs> kind of, it's not raspberry. It's just a really rich uh, red hue. Um, nice little bubbles going on, obviously. <laughs> There's bubbles. <laughs> I'm going to just ring for you. There we go. <laughs> Cheers. So well balanced. Really well balanced. Um, I, I want to just describe to Ciderville what we're seeing here. So the it's has cherries in it, and so that has lent a certain a bit of the the color to the cider. So you have just a really nice uh, hue of that red from the cherries. I'm not sure what kind of cherries are, but we'll we'll ask in a moment. And so a kick is is typically like a. a you would see that for beers being kind of like a very sour beer. This is so much a step down from that sourness because I'm not, I, I like the, that style of beer, but I, a, a lot often it'll be kind of like a pucker. This is not a pucker cider at all. It's when I say balance, just super smooth and you're getting the, the cherry is informing the apple, but it's not taking over. It's really, a delicious cider. Wow. I didn't expect that. I expected something that was going to be a little bit more forceful. And I'm really happy at this stage that it is, that it's not so overpowering because this would go well just alone, but paired with food. Maybe some of the fantastic mm -hmm. cheeses that you have in the Netherlands would be yep. absolutely <clears throat> perfect. Well, you have some tannin going on. I'm salivating right now. <laughs> you, you hit it. You hit it on all... All, all systems go. Why did you choose to make a cider like this? Because this is not something that I see this style too often. I'll see it a little bit, but is it because of the cherries that you have or? Well, so in this orchard where we harvest uh, for many years now, that's called the, the pheasant uh, because there's many pheasants there. Um, it's the... Um, it's an old, uh, big orchard, eight hectares, and they have. We started harvesting the apples there, and then there was a an alley with plums that I found adorable, but just because of the shape of the trees. And then um, at Carnivale Bretonomices, which is a festival here in Amsterdam, where many um, brewers, but like anyone who's interested in fermentation, um, comes over. Um, I actually had a tasting of Revel cider and Solhoy cider. Um, who had plums in there um, and then I thought hey we have this plum alley in this orchard so I thought yes now I can actually do something with it because I had my eye on the, the plums all the time and then in the back of this alley are quite a few cherry trees um, some sour trees and some sweet cherry trees mm -hmm. and so we chose our cider style or however you call it not to use um, fruit or ingredients from abroad, but to like make use of the orchards that we have here because we want to support these orchards. And in order to do so, we want to use all the fruit out of it, uh, but also make people aware again of what we have, the richness. Uh, so I, I love, for example, that you talk about medlars and quinces uh, because some people know them, but many don't anymore. And it's it's lovely to to get people curious again. And um, so we harvested uh, the cherries there. Uh, there's some photos on our Instagram as well uh, from these lovely juicy red uh, cherries to pick from the standard orchard. And uh, so this is half um, sweet cherries, half um, sour cherries. Wow. And we let them, I think they've been in a carboy for a year because the first year we did it only with sour cherries. No, with sweet cherries. And then we did we we didn't like it. it. It missed something. And then we did sour cherries in another carboy. And then we blended some bourbon barrel aged cider in it to give it some more mouthfeel, um, some more tannic structure. Yeah. Um, so that's the composition. As you go deeper into the glass, it's bringing you along. It's not leaving you on the the wayside trying to figure out like, wow, I want, I, I need to keep on sipping into this and mm. discovering because you can't get it on the first sip. And I think that's important mm. for anyone new to yep. cider to really hear that. Like somebody pours you a cider and say, how do you like that? And it's like, you've had the first sip 
And mm. if the cider has complexity, it's going to request <clears throat> of you to not just take one sip, but a number of sips and to, to simmer over it. And that's this kind of cider because it has so uh. much going on here. So is this going to be a, a yearly cider perhaps or is if, we, if we can have the cherries because the um, cherries are hard to grow organically because there's um uh, there's plagues that um, make the cherries rot on the trees uh, and um it's it's a new plague um so that's quite problematic actually so if we can get them we we will but it's part of a series which is our fruit cider so um we also make a plum cider, which is very popular and that we make a lot more of because plums are easier to get for us. And we also make uh, a medlar cider. Uh, so we use the same process and infuse the medlars in the cider. Mm-hmm. Um, and we make a very good cider. So that's where we put black and blueberries in the same way. So macerating them for a long time in the cider. Um, and that's actually where, like you explained very nicely, how this complexity is sort of part of um what i find something that to achieve uh, or, or to strive for uh, a great compliment was a uh, uh, beer sommelier and brewer who was sort of 15 minutes just uh, inhaling the aroma of the very good cider because she was like mm-hmm. taking it in like one smell at a time and uh, <laughs> that was to me i was like enjoying it every minute it's something to Really allow it to to uh, sit a bit in the glass, and also once you empty the glass, to then go back and smell the glass too. Yeah, <laughs> different profiles to come out there. Really, yeah. really awesome! Wow, wow. I mean, I can still remember the cider that I had of yours when I was there in 2018, and I believe that was your saison. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was great. It was beautiful. I had you know, if folks didn't know better i think i actually used the photo i had on my beer column because i always have to send in a photo of me drinking <laughs> okay a great job and i actually was pouring you know people you know the readers didn't know but it was actually your cider that i was pouring at the time <laughs> oh. it, it was you know magnificent so we have the barrel series we have the fruit series any other series yeah. uh terroir terroir so let's talk about that so those are single orchard ciders so uh each orchard will have a collection of apple varieties and um a collection of native yeasts that are present there um so we keep each orchard separate um not all because some orchards they give a lot of fruit maybe of just one variety or not enough fruit but we, tr- we have totes of 600 liters, so we uh, try to get 1,000 kilos. Uh, so those are, will be three and a half big apple bin uh, from an orchard. And then we can fill a tote uh, for fermenting it. And then we actually put not a wild cider as um, the name on the label, but the name of the estate uh, and then wild cider. So it will be... Vredenhorst Wild Cider or Huis de Aarsveld Wild Cider. Uh, so those will be the names of the orchards, which are sometimes farms or estates. Um, and they will all have their different uh, flavor profile and aroma. That's, we've noticed, quite consistent. Um, so that that's interesting, I find. So one, for example, each year has quite this tropical pineapple-like aroma which is very different from the wild cider that we can taste in a bit as well this one is quite rather floral so that's nice distinction that we say this is both 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 wild fermented during the whole winter Mm. and we bottled it in spring and you have these totally different one is a bit floral and and full and almost has some residual sweetness and the other one is tropical pineapple a bit more acidity um yeah, it's very different. But yeah, it's just because of the different apple varieties and, and places where they are from. Because mm-hmm. the soil, by and large, in the Netherlands, is is it kind of similar? You don't really have a, like any kind of granite. No, exactly. It's all, uh, it's all this uh, light clay along the rivers. So it mm-hmm. will not be this mineral uh, aspect. Um, so I... We call it terroir, but I think it's less of the soil and more of the 
apple varieties, the, the, how old the trees are, and um, also the yeast and bacteria that occur uh, in different places. Uh, so they, they might be different as well. It would be interesting to have someone uh, at some point check uh, yeah, what kind of in in the fermentation? What kind of yeast and bacteria do their work in this orchard cider and that orchard cider? Eh, to 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 actually uh, support the yeah. Why are they different? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's probably also not. It's not just the soil, but it's where it's located too, right? So if they're not all yeah. up high on a, a hill. Uh, a little bit lower, all all those factors come into play. And I love yeah. that, you know, you're able to, like, right out of the gate, start talking about terroir. And, mm-hmm. you know, a, a lot of people don't really approach it that way. But here you are, once again, educating the consumers, your, you know, country people and visitors on that there is a difference between one orchard versus another orchard and practices yeah. there. That that's yeah. a win-win for everybody and really commendable. Yeah, it, I think it's part of the education. You know, we we have to explain to people the different kind of fruit that are sometimes forgotten, um, and we have to educate people about these places. Eh? Because if we want to save the orchards for the future, we need to make people aware how special they are, and you do that by giving them a name and bringing people to it. So we work with volunteers. So every year we have uh, around 100 volunteers that join us on harvest days. Uh, So spread out over 10 to 15 days. Um, And then we hit all these orchards and uh, yeah, people talk about it when they're back, you know, like, how was your weekend? Well, I went uh, apple picking with Elegast and we went to this beautiful estate where they have these old trees. And look, this is the cider that they gave me uh, that this made from that orchard the year before. Tip of the glass to Elagast Cidery, which has been a longtime patron of this year podcast. There's also another Netherlands cidery called De Jenner. That's Marcel, also a patron of this year podcast, and the following commercial cideries. Ross on Y Cider and Perry Company, Duck Chicken Cider, based in London, Space Time Mead and Cider Works in Dunmore, Pennsylvania, Insider Japan. Japan's first and only bilingual magazine dedicated to all things cider. Esotero Cider, based in Dolores, Colorado. Teddy Bogle Cider Works of Acme, Pennsylvania. The American Cider Association and the newest member of the Cider Going Up campaign, Olympic Bluffs Cidery in Washington State. Tip the glass to those fine makers and to all the patrons of this year's podcast who support Cider Chat via the Cider Chat Patreon page. Over the last four months, I had finally reached a critical level where I, at last, after going into my seventh year, could finally start selecting names out of a hat to receive the coveted poster that was designed and curated for Randall Graham of Bonnie Doon. It is titled The Periodic Table of Palm Fruit. It is a whimsical poster looking much like the periodic table itself, only this time it is with apples, pears, and all the palm fruit, such as quince and medlars too. This fanciful poster was commissioned by Randall Graham, and I do have a couple of posters left. I don't think you can find them online anymore. Those who have them <laughs> would not let them go easily. So besides just becoming a patron of Cider Chat and supporting this here podcast, if you get in at the $5 or more level, which seems pretty reasonable for a weekly podcast, you too would be put into that possibility of having your name drawn out of the hat and receiving one of the coveted periodic table of palm fruit. I'll have a photo of the periodic table at the show notes for this year, episode 306. And with that, I leave you here 
This is Rio in Color, signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards and having fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms. We like orchards. Having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We, we like cider. Oh, yes, we do. We like palms. Oh, yes, we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We like palms. Oh, yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!